Greetings folks, Dan here. Welcome back to my little corner of the library. Today on Hometown History, we're going to be diving into an oft-overlooked area of New York City history. Specifically, where did early New Yorkers get their water from? Now, early European settlers of Manhattan Island supplied themselves with water using a combination of cisterns, wells, as well as springs that occurred naturally on the island. One of the most famous and well-known springs was referred to as the Collect Pond, although by the early 19th century it had become so putrid thanks to uh, abundance of slaughterhouses in the area that it was no longer usable as a sustainable source of water. In 1805, the Collect Pond would be drained, and New Yorkers would once again be left high and dry looking for a feasible means of supplying themselves with water. Interesting fact about the Collect Pond, when it was drained, it was done so by having a canal cut from the north edge of the pond east and west along Manhattan Island. Now this area would later become Canal Street. As for the pond itself, the area was filled in, although because the foundation underneath the fill was so poor, it actually started to sink, and even worse, started to smell. The upper crust moved out of the area, and it later became a home to low-income immigrants, as well as a haven for street gangs. The center of what had been the pond was an area now called Paradise Square, forming the very heart of New York's infamous Five Points. The first industrial means of supplying Manhattan with water came in 1799 with the chartering of the Manhattan Company. It was founded by a consortium of businessmen led by one Aaron Burr. Yes, that Aaron Burr. The company was ostensibly a utility company designed to provide water to New York City. However, a specific clause in their charter also allowed the company to provide banking services with any excess capital that it happened to have. But why should that matter? The company did provide the city with water. It built a reservoir at Chamber Street that was capable of providing New York City with about 700,000 gallons a day. And it used a system of pipes that were actually formed of hollowed out pine logs that had contracted from a supplier upstate. The reason the proviso in their charter about banking was so important and so controversial is that up to 1799, banking in New York City had been a virtual monopoly by one Alexander Hamilton, who had founded the Bank of New York in 1794. The Manhattan Company, ostensibly to provide water, was actually formed in opposition to Hamilton's monopoly of banking. As given to them in their charter, they were able to provide banking services with any excess capital the Manhattan Company might have been uh, just had lying around after providing water. The company's capital at their start amounted to right around $2 million, which in 1799 is not a small sum of money. The company quickly became more about banking than about water. In 1842, the water system went the way of the dodo as the Croton Aqueduct system uh, came into place, although it would continue to provide banking services on the side, calling themselves a water supply company until 1899, when they officially declared themselves as a bank. The Manhattan Company would later merge and form part of what became Chase Manhattan. So the Collect Pond had been drained. Groundwater was no longer really an option for New Yorkers looking for clean, fresh water, and in 1832, a cholera epidemic ripped through the city. So what was a fledgling, rapidly expanding city to do? They started to look elsewhere, and several ideas were floated by the city planners. Among them, drawing water from the Bronx River, the Passaic River in New Jersey, as well as from the Croton River, just a little bit further upstate. It was eventually decided that the Croton River would be the best idea and the most feasible means for supplying a continuous, steady stream of fresh, clean water to New York. From 1837 until 1842, the Croton River would be dammed, and an aqueduct would be built between the Croton River, just a little bit north of Westchester, all the way into the heart of Manhattan. The river itself was a marvel of modern engineering at the time. It was 45 miles long from the Croton Dam until the distributing reservoir, which is located right around 42nd Street. And although it was 45 miles long, and I want you to really think about this, it had an average grade, because it was gravity-fed, of about 13 inches per mile. So the water dropped 13 inches for every mile of reservoir that was built. That's a descending grade of right around 0.021%. And it worked flawlessly. To ensure that fresh water was able to be supplied to the island at all times, even if the river was running a little bit low, two structures were built on the island itself. As water came into the island of Manhattan through the Croton Aqueduct, the first place that it would stop was a large receiving reservoir. 
Now, this was located near the village of Yorkville, also referred to as York Hill, thus the Yorkville or York Hill Receiving Reservoir. Now, the reservoir was a large rectangle. On the south side, 79th Street. On the north side, 86th. On the east side of the reservoir was 6th Avenue, and 7th Avenue formed the west side. Now, what you have to keep in mind is this was 1842. Most of New York City's population was consolidated below 14th Street. 79th Street didn't actually exist any more than 6th or 7th Avenue or 86th Street. This was farmland or forest. But the city planners wanted to account for the possibility that the city would eventually expand up the island of Manhattan, and thus they laid the reservoir out in line with this city grid. Now, the grid was laid out by John Randall Jr. in 1812, who did an absolutely staggering survey of the entire island of Manhattan, laying out what would later become the famous Manhattan grid. The Yorkville Reservoir was opened on June 27, 1842, and would hold approximately 150 to 180 million gallons. From Yorkville, water would then move further south to Murray Hill, to a small distributing reservoir. Now, the distributing reservoir was constructed from 40, 40th Street to 42nd Street, on the eastern edge of the block, bordering along 5th Avenue. Bear in mind the same thing we said before, the city hadn't reached this point yet, so all of this was just laid out in line with Randall's 1812 survey. Holding about 20 million gallons, this large Egyptian revival building opened on July 4th of 1862, amid much fanfare and celebrating from local residents. Despite this sophisticated plan, by 1851, city planners already could see that the city had expanded so much that a large drought would virtually cripple them, and that the aqueduct wouldn't be able to supply all the water they would need. In February of that year, the city planners purchased an even larger tract of land a little further north from the Yorkville Reservoir, extending from 86th Street up to 96th Street, and from 5th Avenue all the way over to 7th Avenue. The idea behind the purchase was for the construction of a new, larger reservoir that could provide the city with up to 60 days of drinking water just on its own. Construction of this reservoir was complicated slightly a few years afterwards. In 1853, land was purchased for the establishment of a large public park in the middle of the island of Manhattan. The contest was put out for design plans, and in 1858, the winners were announced as Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vaugh. The design that Olmsted and Vaugh came up with was for a very placid, natural park, curvilinear, lots of forests, lots of paths, lots of meadows, very pastoral. And it clashed a little bit with the already existing Yorkville Reservoir, which is just a large rectangle in the middle of their design, as well as the proposed plan for an even larger rectangular reservoir a little further north. They actually hated the Yorkville Reservoir so much, but couldn't do anything about it because it was necessary for the city, that they just decided instead of doing anything else with it, they'd just cover it up with trees and planted large rectangles of trees around it to hide it from public view. As for the tract of land for the new larger reservoir, Olmsted and Vaugh proposed the city a trade. They said, you give us this land that you've purchased for the reservoir and we'll build you a reservoir, but let us make it a nice curved natural looking structure. Let us make it look kind of like a lake and we will save you about $250,000 in excavation and construction costs alone over building a large ugly rectangle. The city planners acquiesced. Probably had more to do with the saving of the $250,000 than with the building of a large kidney bean looking lake in the middle of their city, but nonetheless in 1862 Lake Manahatta opened, the largest reservoir on the island of Manhattan. Today, no active reservoirs remain in Manhattan. The Murray Hill Reservoir at 40th to 42nd and 5th Avenue would be decommissioned in 1898, and the site would go to the construction of the New York Public Library. The Yorkville Reservoir was decommissioned in 1930, and there were a lot of ideas about what to do with this large tract of land in the middle of Central Park. Some favored a parade ground, some favored a war memorial. The idea was ultimately hit upon to make it a large recreational space for New York City residents, with baseball fields, basketball courts, the land was filled in from 1931 until 1934 with a lot of excavation from the 8th Avenue subway line, which was being dug at the time, as well as fill from Rockefeller Center, which was also being constructed. And in 1937, the Great Lawn would officially open. As for the largest of the reservoirs, Lake Manahatta would later be renamed the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Reservoir, although it too would be decommissioned in 1993. Rather than tear it down, however, the city planners opted to leave it there. A jogging path is installed around the outside of it, and today it remains a home for wildfowl. Well, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. As part of the research for this project, I also asked myself the question, is there any physical remains of any of these reservoirs still to be seen in New York today? 
And in answer to that question, I went out and tried to hunt down a few. You can see the results of that project by clicking here. Take, take a look at it. It's a little bit different from my normal filming style. I decided to get out of the library and into the world. Be sure to check that out. I hope you enjoy that as well. I also came across a lot of other odd and unusual stories about New York and Central Park uh, as I was doing the research for this project. I included all of those in uh, uh, the latest blog entry over at the Bookworm History blog. For more information on early New Yorkers and their methods of achieving a sustainable water source, you can check out Water for New York City by Edward Hall. It was originally published in 1917, although a later reissuance in 1993 remains in print through the Hope Farm Press. They're a smaller press, uh, upstate New York, they focus primarily on local history. I'll include a direct link to that in the description below as well. I'll also include links to some other works that I used. Uh, I found a lot of information uh, just for free in Google Books. There are a lot of books that they have, a lot of works about the early water systems that they have scanned in. They're just for free. You can go and check them out. Well, I think that about covers it. As always, hit the subscribe button on your way out to stay up to date on all of our latest episodes. Be sure to check out the Bookworm History blog at bookwormhistory.wordpress.com. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks for stopping by.